thing. Uh, <clears throat> when we come to Job, we're beginning a book of poetry, and then we'll see Psalms and Proverbs, uh, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, and all of that. All right, so Esther. Now, we all know the story of Esther, but this is a contemporary story. That means it is, it, it's a story of today. That means in the story, you don't see God at all. That means that the, the, the word God is not mentioned in the Hebrew book of Esther, which is part of the Jewish Bible. The Jewish Bible, I told you, has only books up to from Genesis to Malachi, and they have only these 39 books. Mm. Okay. And uh, in that is the book of Esther. Now, they were carefully selecting the books for their Bible. And one of the criteria for their careful selection was it has to be in Hebrew. Though es Esther is in the Persian time, where she is the queen of this king, uh, Artaxerxes, and uh, it was written largely by Mordecai, who was her uncle, uh, or a person old enough to, uh, to be her uncle, but probably he was a cousin. We don't really know what the uh, relationship was. So, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, so, what do, this is a book uh, that they carefully selected. Now, it would fail the criteria for their selection because it does not have the word God in it. Mm. All right. It should fail because it is not referring to the God of the Hebrews. It is not referring to the God of Israel. It is not referring to Yahweh. It is not referring to El Elohim. Okay. So how did it qualify? One of the criteria for qualification was it was written in Hebrew, largely believed to have been written by Mordecai. Why didn't Mordecai use the word God? Now that is the mystery. Because he is writing an actual account. He is a godly person. All right. He is a godly person. Mm. It's quite possible that it's possible that he did not use the word God out of fear that it could be destroyed. All right. It could be destroyed if they found it to be um, uh, something that is referring to the Jewish God or referring to Yahweh. He did not know how uh, it will stand the test of time, where it will be found, who will, you know, to whom to hand it. We don't know. Uh, so that is that could be one of the possibilities. So he writes it just the way it happened, and that is uh, that makes the story very special. Not only that, uh, this is one of my favorite books because when things are not moving for me, I ask the Lord, Lord, you could keep a king awake in the night. Mm. You know, in the story, the king is kept awake throughout the night. The guy doesn't get his sleep. And uh, he's had his entertainment and all of that. And it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not yielding to him. So he's awake throughout the night. Now, you see, he's uh, not, the, not that he's irresponsible or anything. He asks for uh, some history books to be brought so that he can read. Mm. Okay. He just says, bring me something to read. So the, uh, because he's not able to sleep in the night, mm. this particular night. So somebody who goes to uh, pull out some scroll, so happened to pull out the scroll of Mordecai, okay, in which Mordecai saves the king from an assassination attempt. Mm. And that is recorded and kept. Now, it's a recent event which happened, so it must have been on the top. Now, people randomly pulled out something and brought. Okay, so I think, I believe here that because the, the, the qualified people who could deal with the archives, for example, the library, if I use the word librarian, he's a qualified person to deal with the archives. Now, if the king told the librarian, go and bring me something to read, the librarian would probably bring him stories of romance or he would bring him some old story which the librarian feels the king has not paid attention to. You understand? Hmm. Because it is in the night, the king just randomly has told some attendant, you know, who's not necessarily a qualified literary guy to understand what should be brought for the king to read. So there is a randomness that is working here uh, through which God is uh, uh, actively doing what needs to be done in history. Mm. So he just brings out that scroll and the king reads about how Mordecai, who sits at the king's gate every day, 
this man saved the king from an assassination attempt he reads that yeah right and a small mention is given to mordecai in that all right mm. so when it is given like that so because why is a small mention given because mordecai is a jew and they did not want to bring jews into the forefront yeah all right so the small mention is given but his i the king's i falls on what mordecai has done and he asks uh, what has been done for this man mordecai mm. so the people out there whoever is attending to the king because of a sleepless night tell that you know i don't think anything is has been done and so he is a little restless and when it is early morning the king's prime minister haman is walking in and uh, the king calls haman and says come here what should be done for the person who has done good for the king and haman assumes that it is himself mm. all right so he says the king should put his robe on this man <clears throat> put him on the king's horse mm. and he should be read, led through the streets of susa susa is the capital city of uh, persia there he should be led through the streets of susa uh, by a high ranking official with a proclamation that this is what is done for those who are good to the king so the king immediately says do that for mordecai and you be the high ranking official you know so this is the this is the the way in which randomness is working you know so when things are not working for me uh, or when i'm hitting a wall you know i ask the lord lord see i can't go further with this you have to keep somebody up in their sleep you have to give them something to read and you have to do something for me nothing is good and god you are in the shadows keeping watch over your own and believe me jos believe me my friends god has always moved always moved favorably in my direction so uh, in the direction of the prayers that i pray so i would suggest you to keep this as a uh, as a a, a, a personal uh, book for yourself read through it it's it's a very short book read through it again and again and you will discover some amazing things in the book how god works through history even when people are not referring to him and people are not seeking him all right so this is something that i would encourage you all to do let's get to the story of esther so esther is a beautiful girl and uh, the king already has a queen vashti her name is vashti and uh, in one of his drinking uh, parties uh, every party lands up in a drinking uh, drinking binge or whatever you call that oh, they just outdo themselves every session so in one of those things he tells vashti to come uh, in her royal finery so that he can display to his guests how beautiful she is all right now vashti being a, a woman of whatever repute and she is the queen no other wife of the king can be the queen okay so he has named her as the queen so vashti does not want to uh, come into that kind of a setting and be uh, you know be jeer, uh, be leered at the word that i would use here is leering leering you know and um, so she being some of some repute she does not want to do that so she doesn't come and this hurts the king now not only does it hurt it hurts the reputation and next day there is a there is a council convened and the, the all the prime uh, the, the ministers everybody gathered together and says see this is a example where a woman disrespected her husband all right now you being the highest person you being the first man in the country and she being the first woman okay you called her and she disobeyed you so this is an insult to every man in the country and tomorrow people, every woman will start disobeying so what does it tell you of the culture it tells us that it was a culture where women were suppressed women were used as items of pleasure and beauty and you know they were used as showcase item showcases i mean showcase items you know people used to uh, say she is so beautiful and things like that so this is the kind of uh, so what to do okay i understand it's going to go against every man so what to do ask the king so they said okay dethrone her as the queen remove her from that position okay <clears throat> so the king does that now he needs a queen okay now look at this clever point here he needs a queen if the king selects a queen from the existing women who are already there in his harem okay that means he is picking a, a second command 
All right. Now he has picked Vashti as the queen because none of them there qualify to be the queen. Now he cannot pick from the existing pool there. So he is relegated Vashti to the harem. And now he's, the, the ministers suggest that let a search be made and uh, women who are beautiful and girls who are beautiful be brought to the king. Let them be put under selection, be done and a training be given to them so that at the end of this uh, uh, training, we will select one as the queen. Now the people are going all over, the soldiers go everywhere looking for, you know, a certain framework to be uh, a, a certain uh, a certain person who fits the framework. And they gather so many women and bring. And in that, Esther is captured. Esther, who is a Jew. Now there's no criteria. Now listen to this, this is very important. There is no criteria for the woman in the sense she just has to be uh, pretty, pretty yeah. you know, in, in every aspect. That is what the king is looking for. It doesn't matter if she's from, uh, she's from a, a tribe or a country or she's from any kind of country or any kind of culture. So he's okay with a Jew also. So they are just given the criteria to of a woman. Mm. Okay. Now, so what does it tell us? It tells us even in this male dominated woman suppressed situation god is moving he is moving powerfully getting esther into that pool which is selected and getting esther to qualify to be the queen you see it's not a lot they didn't cast a lot and pick esther no she fit all the criteria and finally she qualifies you see the hand of God in this. Now, you look at it the other way. How much of resistance would have been there from Esther? In spite of all that, she qualifies. So there is a breaking of the human spirit. All right. It could be there in the case of Esther. That means as Esther was going up the levels of qualification, like Miss Universe or Miss World or something like that, as she's going up the levels and qualifying at each level, her resistance gave up. Or she yielded and said, okay, this is going to be my life. So I, I better not expect anything else. So what is she doing? She is looking to the God of Israel and just resigning herself to his hands. Though the word God of Israel does not appear there at all. The word God does not appear in the book of Esther at all. Mm. That makes the book very special. Because in today's situation, you and I and all of us would use the word God help me and all of that. But we never see the trace or we never see God move physically in our situation. We never see. But the, what is this book giving us the assurance? This book is giving us the assurance that God is in the shadows, keeping watch over us, his own. Mm. That is the powerful message of this book. And he moves whenever it, he has to move. And he is moving history. He is moving his kingdom. And uh, he is protecting his people. So Esther being selected. Now the person who was looking after Esther is her uncle or her old, old enough cousin Mordecai. Now this man, because Esther is put into the palace, he has a habit of sitting at the palace gate every day. Because, you know, his heart is after this little child he looked after, brought, you know, how will it be, man, to, to give up a child huh? and into the hands of a vicious voracious, you know, kind of a man, but he's the king, what to do, how it would, uh, would be, you know, so this man is sitting at the gate of the palace. Hmm? Mm. So maybe there were people sitting at the palace and every time this man, Haman, who is the prime minister of the king, used to walk into the palace, everybody used to stand up. You know, nowadays when we are coming into the, uh, into our uh, apartment communities, the security sometimes will stand up, you know, Mm. No need for him to stand up. We are not some general or colonel or something. But they stand up out of respect. Okay. Now, suppose there was a person standing up, uh, two or three people who are there in the security. They were standing up every day whenever you or me or any of us entered the community. And then there is another person who is appointed newly and he doesn't stand up. It, okay. He doesn't stand up at all. It will stand out in our mind that this person is not standing up. You understand? I mean, I don't know whether you would agree, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you will see that one person is not yielding. And that began to happen with Haman. Mm. Mordecai did not stand up for Haman. 
<clears throat> Sometimes I think, what does it cost you when to stand up? Just do it. Why do you want to get into trouble? But in Mordecai, see, these are all not written. This is called reading into the text, not extrapolating, not interpreting at random, and not uh, interpret, interpret, interpreting wildly also. This is reading into the text because your questions will develop. When your questions develop, I mean, you, you, whenever I, I teach this book, most people have made it their favorite book because it's a contemporary book. It's, it's exactly the way it happens. It, it can happen to us today. Okay. So many unanswered prayers. So many unanswered prayers. The no trace of God. Uh, no sign of him doing anything at all. Okay. But our prayer can be the silent prayer of Esther, which is not recorded here. It can be the silent prayer. So Mordecai did not stand up. Haman is noticing it. And uh, then all trouble starts. So he goes to the king and says, you know, there is, he's inquiring about Haman and he finds out that Haman is a Jew. Okay. And so he's inquiring, why doesn't this fellow stand up? He's okay. inquiring about Mordecai. He's inquiring about Mordecai. Why doesn't this fellow stand up? So people are telling, listen, sir, every time you walk into the apartment complex, others will stand up because they're all security people. Now, this man who is appointed, he's actually a captain from the army. Okay, so he's not going to stand up. So don't mind it. You know, they will tell us probably that. And then we say, okay, yeah, he's a captain. He'll only stand up for his superior. He's not going to stand up. It's okay. It's not a deal breaker for us. We will let it go. But when this explanation was given to Haman, he got upset. He said, why don't these fellows stand up? So the history of these Jews was narrated to him that the Jews are like that. They only stand up to their own elders and the people that God places in their life. And that is the fabric in Haman's backbone. What is Haman, uh, sorry, in Mordecai's backbone? What is the fabric in Mordecai's backbone? That he will only stand up for a person of God. And he's not seeing any of that kind of goodness in, in the city of Persia, Susa. He's not seeing any goodness like that. So he's gotten used to not standing up for anybody because it's a pagan culture. They are only into revelries and orgies and uh, parties and merrymaking and every kind of uh, uh, pleasures that is known to uh, that can that can conjure up in the human mind they've given themselves to it and Mordecai being a Jew Esther being a Jew the Jews keep themselves from eating certain meats they keep themselves from observing they keep themselves in observing certain days and festivals and all these things are happening so Haman discovers all the senses oh so these are the people so he goes to the king and he says, now I want to recommend something to the king. There is a certain kind of people in our country who do not respect us and who can become a threat for us in the future. So it is my recommendation that on the 13th day of Purim, you know, now the 13th day of Purim and all that is not important for us. But if you want to understand and study the book of Esther and keep it personally, passionately for yourself. You know, you just take it. It's the 12th month of the year. So take it as December. And 13th is not a so good number. So take it as December 13th. Okay, just for you to understand. So you'll remember, you'll remember the details. So he says on the 13th day of Purim, I want all of these people to be killed. So we will empower our people to start a civil war and kill every Jew they have in sight. Okay. And we should make out an edict right now. We should make out a proclamation right now and send it across to all parts of our country kingdom so that wherever these Jews are, our people have time to identify them. Are we living, are we living in times as this? I think we, we are closely there. Okay, So that all of these people can be identified. There is enough time to identify where these kind of people are. Our people can arm themselves suitably. And on the 13th day of Purim, they can commit this genocide, you know, and we, our country kingdom will be rid of these people. And the king, you know, largely in being in hangovers, you know, uh, he's uh, agreeing to it and he gives his uh, royal seal from the king's uh, uh, ring. This is signed. So this is what has happened. Now, when Ham uh, Mordecai comes to know of this, he is shocked. Okay. Now, Esther doesn't come to know of it. Mordecai comes to know. And then he gets in touch with Esther. So probably because he's the relative of Esther, he had some access to her. He could speak to her 
um, for a given time, maybe like the jails, they allow, you know, in the jail, they will allow people to meet across a barricade or across a grill and you can talk. Maybe Haman was, I mean, maybe Mordecai was given such privileges to speak to Esther being the relative. And uh, Esther being the queen could have also asked for those privileges to speak to her uncle or nephew, Mordecai. She could, uh, being the queen, so she could have those privileges also. And Mordecai conveys it to Esther. And Esther says, what do you want me to do? I am a queen to this man. That's it. I don't have any role to play. What do you want me to do? And then Haman says, this very important verse, Esther chapter 4, verses 14 to 17. I'm going to read it. Esther chapter 4, verses 14 to 17. <clears throat> Why this is an important verse? It can inspire each one of us, you know. Uh, it can inspire each one of us to, to speak those very words. And those words can inspire us to tell God, Lord, I want to do this for you. Okay. Chapter 4, verses 14 to 17. Okay, so Esther, I'm going to read a little, a uh, little forward also. Okay, yeah. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, huh? when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, she's telling uh, Mordecai, uh, "Listen, I can't do much. I I'm helpless. I can't do much. Don't expect anything from me." That's what she's telling. Is that our reply? Largely, that can be our reply to God's call, you know. But I think that's okay because it opens an honest dialogue between us and God. I think that's okay. If we feel inadequate, we feel fearful of answering God's call. We feel fearful of losing the pleasures that we have now or feel fearful of what God may subject us to in the call. We can openly discuss with him, okay. So when Esther's words are reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. Mordecai is uh, getting uh, angry. So he's telling, don't think you will escape because you are in the king's house. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance from the Jews will arise from another place. What is Mordecai telling? He knows that the God of Israel has always brought deliverance. Mm. And what is happening now? People are beginning to tear their clothes and weep because this kind of an order has gone across the country and kingdom. Yeah. The Jews are beginning to tear their clothes and weep. What is it bringing them to? It is bringing them to a repentance. It is bringing them to a spirit of unity. Every persecution should bring us to a spirit of repentance and unity. Mm. Is it valid for today? It, it definitely is valid for today. Okay. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to royal position for such a time as this. No, he's telling you, you and your father's family will perish. How will you perish? If the king knows, comes to know tomorrow that you are also a Jew and you have been kept without being killed because you're the queen. Now, somebody can, uh, because it's a, it's an open questioning system. You know, the, the officials can question and the officials can question and say, oh, king, what about Esther? Now, how can there be an exception given to her? Because your order says all. So the king would say, okay, we'll have to kill her. And what is there for him? You'll find another queen, yeah. you know? So uh, Mordecai is seeing all of that in advance. And he's telling Esther, you and your father's family will perish. So what do you want to do? But he gives one last line of encouragement. He says, who knows that you have been brought to this position for such a time as this. The God is speaking to somebody today. He's speaking to all of us today. And those of us who get the cue should take it, I guess. That we have been brought to whatever position we are in life right now. We have been brought to positions of power or positions of influence or positions of uh, leadership in the family or in the community for a time such as this. All right. And from then on, Esther starts planning and she says, listen, I can't do much, but here is what I will do. I am going to fast for three days. She can't send that message. There is somebody called, um, uh, there's, some, there's somebody who carries the message to Mordecai. And uh, he's, he's a kind of a eunuch who looks after the women in the harem. 
So he carries this message to Mordecai. Now, maybe Esther did not want to use the word God because, you know, she would be giving out a clue. So she also sends this reply to Mordecai. Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. I'm fasting. Go gather all the Jews who are in Susa because uh, we don't have the power to send out a proclamation to the entire kingdom or running on horses and telling everybody all the Jews fast and pray. No. But she knows that through Mordecai, he has the ability to gather all the Jews in Susa, at least in that little uh, local town, to gather and fast and pray for me. To, to fast for me. Do not eat or drink for these three days, for three days, night or day. I and my maids will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Now she comes to a beautiful conclusion. She knows one way or the other she will perish. When she is discovered that she is a Jew, the king will order her to be killed as well. And what is going to happen? He's going to get another wife. That's all. Okay. That is the routine. That's the process. So she knows that. And she says, okay, I'm going to fast. All of you fast with me. She does not use the word pray there. She says, all of you fast. So what is this fast about? It is about praying. It is about praying. Jesus did not separate fast from fasting from praying. He says, this kind of an evil spirit you can cast out only by fasting and praying. He didn't use the word only fast. So fasting and praying are two sides of the same coin. Only when we use it in that way. You know, most of us today, when it, uh, we fast, but we don't pray. You know, we, we feel a, a righteousness in our spirit when we have fasted. You know, we have given up non veg during the 40 days or something like that. You know, uh, I don't know. I don't know about the others. I'm not accusing anybody. But I, I used to feel like that. You know, I'm, I'm fasting for three days, four days. Then some kind of nicety will come into my spirit. You know, oh, I'm fasting. I'm, I'm fasting. But prayer was almost zero. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. You know, and then run everywhere. So this should not be the case. And then Esther, after those three days, sends a request to the king. What was the threat of Esther perishing? If the king does not stretch out his scepter and receive her, it means she has acted out of protocol, outside of protocol, and she can be relegated to be an ordinary queen, ordinary uh, uh, person in the king's harem. She can be de-promoted or what do you call uh, relegated. You know, she can be put down in her position. That is one. And it can also be the king can order Esther to be killed. You know, these are the two, um, the two outcomes of stepping out of protocol and doing something. So she says, I'm going to fast and I'm going to meet the king after three days. If I perish, I perish. See the courage that comes now. If fasting and a word of inspiration can bring courage it brings it to Esther. And so she's there and the king stretches out his scepter, receives Esther and he tells Esther. She goes in her finest dresses and she goes and meets the king in his court. So the king is so uh, captivated or something like that is not mentioned there. But what does fasting do to you? Fasting makes you presentable before the highest powers on earth. Please remember that. Fasting and praying makes you presentable. It made Esther presentable on that day. And when king stretched out the scepter, he said, even if it means half the kingdom, I will give you. So that means that kind of a favor was prepared. So how was Esther praying? The fourth day when I'm going to meet the king, he can order me to be beheaded. He can order me to be killed. He can just relegate me and remove me from my position. And the day he finds out I'm a Jew, I could also be killed. But I'm just hastening my death. I'm just going to take this chance and meet the king. So her fasting and praying has done much for her. So dear friends, I suggest that we all develop a healthy uh, habit of fasting and praying. Why do I call it a habit? Once it becomes a habit, you will not let go of it. So somewhere in a week, if you can fast, now people will call me and ask, I mean, it's all has happened to me in the past. Okay, they call and ask, brother, can we drink milkshake? Then I ask, I quietly ask, what milkshake? They will say, I will cut a milkshake. <laughs> <laughs> you know, basically you're trying to beat your fast. So, 
So all these kinds of questions come, <laughs> you know. So can we, you know, I am a diabetic. I mean, that's what people say. I'm not that I'm saying I'm a diabetic brother. So can I drink some kind of, you know, some kind of sugary drink and all that? So what I say is, so you fast as much as you can. And if you're a diabetic and you shouldn't fast, don't fast. But let your spirit of prayer be there, where even if you miss a meal, you are standing in the spirit of fasting. So it is not about the religion of fasting and praying. It is about your heart that the Lord sees. Right. So after this has happened, uh, and uh, Esther does not ask the king for half his kingdom. You know, she could have straight away asked for Haman to be killed. I thought, you know, but she doesn't do that. She calls her the king for a meal. She says, I've prepared a banquet for the king and I want you to attend it along with uh, Haman, your prime minister. Mm -hmm. says, okay, you get ready, Haman. We are, we are having a, a banquet which is ordered by the queen. And Haman goes home, gets all dressed up nicely and he says, listen, this is done. Now that I am in the favor of the queen also, uh, he's calling a party. So, you know, it, it's an afternoon kind of lunch, I guess. I don't know, this guy immediately called all his friends. He's a boasting kind of guy, you know, called all his friends and had a quick uh, a little party there. And he said, now it's a great time for me to get rid of this Mordecai who doesn't stand up for me. So uh, I'm going to ask for a favor from the king also that uh, this fellow be put to death. What kind of uh, death I should have for him? So he goes and attends the party for the king uh, with, the, with Esther. After the party, the king knows she has something in her mind. Okay, Queen Esther, tell me what do you want? Even if it means half the kingdom, I will give you. Mm. She says, no, I want you to come tomorrow also with Haman for a, for another banquet. She says, okay. Mm. So now Haman goes home and asks the suggestions from his people. What kind of death this Mordecai should have? So they are telling you, build a, build a gallows 70 feet high. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, uh, maybe 70 or 7 and all of that was... Uh, uh, you know, 70 and 7 were all Jewish numbers, you know, which they had some affinity to. So, 7 feet high, if you hang uh, Mordecai, it's not going to look good. You know, he'll hardly be a few inches from the ground. So, they said it's 70 feet, you know. These Jews all like this number 70. So, put it in 70 feet high and hang him on a gallows. So, all that was planned. And he comes back for the second day. And when he comes from the second day, Esther says, our enemy is this man Haman. Look at her words, carefully chosen. Our enemy is this man Haman. And he has ordered this. And I want you to look into this. And the king immediately knows. Now he knows. He knows that Haman has done this. I don't know what was going on in the king's mind. The king probably knows that Esther is a Jew. And suddenly it could have struck him that, oh, Haman wants to kill my queen also. You know, that could have gone in. His, we don't know what is that. There is, there is a certain randomness operating here. Yeah. Okay. And events are falling into place. Things are falling into place. Now, these things you won't read there in, in Esther. But continue to read it and you'll have so many discoveries you'll make for yourself. And, uh, uh, and the, the word India appears in the book of Esther because the kingdom of uh, Xerxes extended up to India. All right. So India, the word India is there in Esther. So as much as we are going through a time like this, now don't think that is a, that is a coincidence. As much as we are going through a time like this, God has included the word India into Esther. Why? Our situation is mapped. It is emerging to be that of Esther and her people. Yeah. Our situation is being like that. You know. So we should all take this as a leading from the Lord and start fasting and praying. As much as we want to be united with our other Christian brothers and sisters, and we also come into a spirit of repentance. Repentance for what? Repentance for disunity. Okay, one of the most first things that we should repent of is disunity. Why? Because when Mordecai called for fasting in the city of Susa, what is the first thing? Lord, only some things like this bring us together. We are sorry for it. You know, so what is he praying for? He's praying for the spirit of unity that has come upon us because we never thought we could unite and pray. We're living in our play, in our own things, you know. Everybody is doing their business, prospering. Suddenly, one edict has come. We don't know what kind of edict that is. <coughs> edict has come that all these kind of people should be given a cruel treatment. And so, we are in times like this. And Esther says, 
what is it that you want? The king asks us, what is it that you want, my queen? And she says, I have heard that uh, this man has made a gallows, hmm? 70 feet long. Put him on the gallows. The king cannot refuse the king. He refuse Esther. Why do you think he cannot refuse Esther? He has uttered twice, once in the presence of all his court, even half the kingdom I'm ready to give you. Yeah. And he has uttered in the presence of Haman and Esther, even half the kingdom I will give you. Tell me what is it. If he asks for Haman to be hanged. And once the king sees the treachery of Haman, he goes and stands outside in the balcony because he's coming to, re he's reconciling in his own thoughts now and saying, oh my goodness, such a plot happened and I didn't know any. This guy pulled it off right under my nose. Mm. He's getting my queen killed. He's, he's brought an edict which is so cruel that it's going to involve my queen also. You know, that is, he thinks that. And uh, this Haman is uh, falling at Esther's feet mm -hmm. and pleading. So when the king comes back from the balcony, he sees Haman in a not so very right position with the queen, you know. So he gets a reason now. He gets a, uh, he gets a reason, excuse for uh, killing Haman. He says, now in my, in front of me, are you going to molest the queen? My, my, own, my own wife, you're going to molest. You see how the wickedness, wicked heart of the king, God is using to protect his people. Okay, so uh, the king is thinking now how to get him, how to get Haman killed, how to hang the fellow, and this is going to be a big this is going to be a big move for me because he's my prime minister, and I'm going to kill this fellow. I better have a good enough explanation. When he comes inside and he sees a Haman falling on the feet of Esther, it so occurs to him that he's uh, he's trying to molest the queen. You know? So that he makes as a charge. And he says, in my presence itself, you are going to do this. And he calls the guards and finishes off with Haman. So Haman is hanged on the very gallows that he built. Now Esther goes to the king and says, listen, I want you to repeal this law. And the king says, I cannot repeal what I have passed. Okay. And I have passed it with my royal signet and seal. So she says, you make another law that these people can defend themselves. That the Jews also can arm themselves identify their prospective enemies who will come against them on the 13th day of Purim and they can defend themselves. So when this edict goes out, most of the people who are thinking of killing them also will back out, you know, because it's going to be, it's not a genocide because you cannot repeal what the king. So this is how God worked in the life of, uh, through Esther, through Esther, a girl who was chosen in very, very bad circumstances. And God leads a huge deliverance. Okay, I'm going to pause here and uh, see if we can have a few questions and then we'll go to the book of Job. Yeah. <coughs> One second, let me, uh, yeah, unmute. Yes, George. Yeah, brother was telling that uh, fasting and prayer. Mm. And uh, I have a small doubt, not doubt, a small question to brother which is more powerful prayer is powerful praising is powerful because daniel chapter 10 we read that when daniel prayed god sent angel he was withheld in demonic spirit and he was released after 21 days yeah to come and give that message yeah but word of god says god dwells in the praising praises of his powerful best yeah yeah. So, uh, David, if you take the David, mm. David is always to worship God, worship God, praise and worship God. Mm. And the word of God says, God dwells in the praise and worship of the people, mm. which is powerful. Now, yeah. the prayer is powerful, praising is powerful. Yeah. George is a good friend of mine. He's a chartered accountant. He's joined our meetings from yesterday. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so... Uh, so, so uh, it's, a, it's a good question and I think that a lot of us have uh, gotten into this because we want answers to our prayer and so what happens is many times when you are in difficulty people suggest to us don't worry about your difficulty brother just keep praising God just keep praising God all right now if you try to do that as a practice it is it is really a struggle if you try to do that as a practice that means in your difficult moments if you're just going to keep praising god you can find it to be difficult but then what do you praise god for you praise god in joy that means for all the good things that he has done to you till now 
So your praise is basically emanating as a gratitude. So please do that. All right. And the second uh, thing, not the le not the lesser important thing, is prayer. We have to bring before the Lord what we need. Okay, what we need. And if you, when we go to the book of Psalms, you will see David is praying prayers of uh, sad prayers, sad prayers. Okay, he's praying, but then suddenly he will come off into a praise. He will suddenly come into a praise and start worshiping. So this praise, prayer, and worship, they're all. They're all linked together. Don't try to separate it. And uh, today, we as children of the cross and children of the resurrection, that we uh, the Holy Spirit is with us to lead us into how to pray. And uh, so that is something that I encourage everybody to do. Praise God. And as you want to talk about your needs to God, start talking those needs. Suddenly, again, you'll go back to praise. And then there will be times of worship. Worship is, is not praise. Worship is acknowledging God for who he is. All right? Praise is basically about gratitude. And, uh, you know, it is not like, God, you are great. That is praise. Yes, but uh, that, is, that, that is praise. But when you uh, do it out of gratitude is when you have a connect. You will be able to do it well. Thank you, okay. brother. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Ajit, you want to say no. <coughs> Brother, in, in Esther, why is this all these uh, chapters haywire? Sorry? In, in Esther, in the book of Esther, hmm. it starts with 11, 12, then goes to 1, then again 13 and all that. Yeah. Why is that, it? that is because you're reading Esther Greek. Esther Greek is another book of Esther written because in the book of Esther, there is no mention of God. They wrote another book. Okay, this was written in Greek in order to bring in God. Now, after the book of Esther was closed by Mordecai and uh, it started uh, going out to people and uh, these people wrote another book because in that, they suddenly realized that the word God is not there. So uh, when I was teaching, another lady got up and said, no, brother, in this book, it is a lot of prayers are there and uh, God is there and things like that. So that is Esther Greek, which you are reading. And in that, there is, a, there, is a, there is no order in that sense, just like as a book of history, there is no order. It just goes back and forth. So I would suggest you to read Esther and you can read Esther Greek also, though in our Catholic Bible, that does not form part of the Catholic Bible. But uh, those books are published in our Catholic Bible for inspirational reading. We only have seven books and Esther Greek does not form part of the seven books. So what happens is immediately after Esther, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, there will be Esther Greek or Esther and then Esther Greek. You know, they're trying to put it in order. So Esther will come uh, there and then, you know, we all can get confused. So I would suggest that you stick to the 39 books, then read the Deuterocanonicals. We're going to read the uh, other seven books that are the extra books for the Catholics given as scripture. We're going to read that and then we go on to the New Testament. So if, if you do that, you will get a clean uh, trace of history and how poetry was important and how visionary. Visionary means uh, the seeing of visions. It comes to Dan. It comes in the book of Ezekiel and uh, uh, in, in the book of Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Daniel, how visions are important. There were no miracles in those times, only visions. And because of this man of God, there were miracles happening, you know, writing on the wall and all of that were miracles uh, in the in the lines. Then all of those were miracles, but they were those miracles were personal to Daniel. All right. So that is how it is. So try to read Esther as the uh, as the Hebrew book. That will be helpful. Hmm? Shall we go quickly to Job? What are we doing on time? Yeah, Lo uh, Lovella, I wanted to quickly ask some uh, questions. Yes, yes, Jos. Um, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, Brother Julius, uh, one uh, one quick thought came to mind related to George's question. You know? Yeah. And you can uh, please correct me if I am thinking wrongly or you know. Uh, okay. I right. just I just feel related to prayer and praise. Mm. Uh, you know. Press sometimes, this is from my own experience too. Uh, press sometimes, or most of the times, you know, if press don't, if action of cleaning up within yourself does not go along with uh, the prayers, you know, that you want, that you're making for mm. healing or, or change in uh, circumstance, uh, 
Mm. Braz need not work because mm. there has to be an act that goes along with it, wherein you're making a change within yourself yeah. or doing something to, to you know, uh, to to better your your situation and yourself. And then along with it comes when you see change, when you see uh, God's blessings coming through because of what sacrifices you make yeah. or. or that could also mean a, a way of fasting, you know. Yeah. It could be a spiritual fasting in some way or denying yourself of, in the flesh in some way as, as a kind of a, uh, an act, an action. That's when the praise comes in also. And that attitude of gratitude just flows within you in time uh, when you start making changes within yourself. That's something I, I, I have uh, that has been growing within me slowly and gradually and and is that something correct me is that something yeah. that you Good feel day. is right or thank you for sharing i will uh, uh, i will uh, uh, i will be happy for you and bless you that you are on a journey and this is very good this is the way the journey begins and it goes on all right so the question here is how quickly are you able to come into the presence of god now when it comes to praise like you said there has to be a cleansing you know people start a prayer like this you know they start in moments of prayer thank you jesus praise you jesus because they want to come into that mood of prayer i i understand they want to come into that mood of prayer so this thank you jesus praise you jesus glory to you lord you know we are uh, withdrawing from all that we were doing all that our minds were connected with and we are coming into the presence of god that's a good thing that's the way it has to be practiced when you come into presenting the reverence how quick are you able to get into the presence of god okay when we um, read roman yeah no i'm not asking yeah. you a question i'm just oh, yeah. okay okay so Sorry. When, when you yeah so when you come to the book of of Romans, the Spirit Himself, the Holy Spirit Himself, cries out with our Spirit, Abba, Father. All right, Jesus was instantly in the presence of His Father. So, our journey begins like this. We want to have a time of cleansing of our minds because we have to extricate ourselves from whatever we are doing. You know, for example. In my religious days, I'll be coming from a movie. And because the prayer, <laughs> 3 30, the movie has 4 30, the movie has finished. Imagine 5 30, I want to finish off with church. Okay. So I will come from the movie straight to the church. Now, what I will do is I'll stand outside the church and try to get into a right frame of mind before I come into the church. Okay. So there are various examples like that. I'm not saying uh, uh, praising God and coming into his presence is like my example. No, that's the way I used to do it. But when I realized that the spirit himself calls out with us, I have a father. We are immediately in the presence of God. And we can start. Just, just, just think, your loving dad, you just come. See, none of our dads will fit that bill, will fit that picture of Abba Father. And Jesus called his father Abba. And we are given that same word to call. And we're not calling it out on our own. The spirit of Jesus, the Holy Spirit calls out with us. So I will suggest that you're on the right. I, I will definitely appreciate that you're on the right track. You should continue. And there will come a day very soon where you are able to come immediately into the presence of God by just calling out to the spirit, Abba, and you're in his presence. And after coming into his presence, the spirit may lead you into worship. It is not to come into a right frame of mind. It is not to cleanse because we are never clean enough to come into the presence of God. He just brings us into his presence out of his grace. And that is why Paul goes on to say, we have the boldness to come before the throne of grace. Boldness, not qualification. We have the boldness to come before the throne of grace, to find mercy and grace in times of need. All right? So I would suggest, Thank I you. would appreciate you're on the right journey. And very soon, uh, those of you will be praying for you, that Lord, uh, praying for every person to have an intimate relationship with God is one of my favorite prayers. So we'll include all of you and you will be coming into the presence of God instantly. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on. Uh, anybody? Hazel? Hazel? You have a uh, yeah. little bit... Uh, Okay, yeah. we will we will move on. Yeah. 
Job. We come to the book of Job. Now, this is one of the books that made me angry against God. Okay. Now, this is one of the books that got me very angry against him. You know, and I was telling, you know, you just picked on a poor guy who did everything right with you. You just picked on this fellow. The guy didn't even know what was happening. And suddenly, every kind of misfortune was unleashed on him. Okay. When, when I uh, began to read the book of Job, chapter 1 itself, it begins by saying, in the land of Uz, there was a man called Job. He was upright with God. That means his up relationship was right with God. Okay, now that is very important for us because it is prior to the days of Christ. There was no grace given, but God was operating through grace to all those who turned to him. God was reaching out to everybody through grace. Absolutely no need for God to reach out to Job or to Moses or anybody. But when people came to them, came to God in, in their predicaments, God responded with grace and did mighty miracles for them and called them out for great deliverances. All right. So in Job, we find that his up relationship was very right with God. And that's why he's called, he was upright with God. And he was a man who offered his sacrifices and he had children, right? And uh, uh, he had children and he had 10 children and he had a lot of wealth. He prospered. He was the ideal uh, person I would call because uh, every kind of prosperity was there with him. All right. And having been all that, he was a man who never failed in his respects to God. He never failed in his respects. So he was also offering sacrifices for his own children mm. in case they might have done something wrong and they were not sensitive to it. So he would offer sacrifices on his children's behalf also. So this was how things were playing out here on earth. But something else is happening in heaven. Now, as much as we call other scriptures as mythology, whenever it comes to heaven, we don't know what time frame it belongs to. Yeah. Okay. So this is happening in heaven. And we are given a vision of what is happening in heaven. That means we are given a cross section of that kind of a, a scene that happened in heaven. Okay. The various, various hosts. Hosts means they could be angels. They could be God's representatives. They could be angels. They could be God's representatives who God works through in our, in, in a history. They came reporting to God and Satan also was among them. That means Satan also was a host. He was a created angelic being. So he was also among them. And he had nothing to report. He had a look, a smug look on his face. And God asked Satan, because God is already reading the heart of Satan. He asked Satan, where have you been? That means, what is your report, man? Give me your report. He says, I have been through to and fro of the earth. So the, the, the New Testament, no, it says that the devil is like a lion going to and fro, uh, looking for people to devour. That is his occupation right from the beginning. So as he's doing this, the Lord immediately interrupts the devil and says, no, now I understand why that smug look is on your face because the whole earth, the whole earth is under the sway of Satan. And God knows that's why, you know, suppose Satan is coming back to report to God and he's basically telling God, God, the whole earth is with me. What kind of report you want? Don't you know it? Mm. That is the kind of transaction. That's the kind of transference of uh, words that is happening there in heaven. And God cuts Satan in his mid-talk and he says, have you seen my servant Job? There is none like him. Mm. Now from here begins the <coughs> cosmic game. From here begins the cosmic game. Satan says, yeah, I know he's the only exception. You know, God is happy with that exception because through Job, God can accomplish what he wants to do on the earth, even though the entire humanity is under the sway of Satan. And he tells Job will not be upright with you and do good to you, but for the prosperity you've given him. Just remove your hands from that prosperity and then you see what will happen. So God tells Satan, okay, all that he has is in your hands. All right? All that he has is in your hands, but you cannot touch the person, Job. So the next day, on earth, 
a series of disasters, a series of disasters is played out. You know, the four winds, north, south, east and west, they come crashing onto a house where Job's children were celebrating and having a good meal. North, south, east and west. It's not like a typhoon. It's not like a tornado. But it is a wind that came from four sides converging into this one place where the children were. So the children were also a sign of Job's prosperity. Mm. And he went and got all of that destroyed. He got all the cattle destroyed. And Job was shocked. Ten of his children gone. He did not curse God. What does Job, uh, Satan want to do? He wants to bring about a curse. He wants to bring about a, a, a slur from the mouth of Job. That is his attempt. He comes back to God. And God is immediately starting the conversation. What Satan? You're not able to do it. And Satan says, because you have protected him and put a hedge around his body, that is why he is not cursing you. Just give me access to him personally and you see what will be done. So the Lord says, okay, Job is in your hands, but his life you cannot touch. That means you cannot kill him. You see, Job is put into a loop of infinity where he cannot die now. He cannot be killed. All right. So what kind of suffering? It is an infinite suffering. It is like hell on earth for Job. And Satan goes and strikes Job with sores. And the poor man has to scratch himself, hurting himself everywhere. You know, some years ago, maybe two years ago, I had this sudden allergy. And I had to scratch my feet, you know, just below my knees. And it was just scratchy, scratchy, scratchy all the time. I was just thinking what Job might have gone through. His entire body was like that, not just below his knees. So he went through that. And finally, where did he find his relief? He found his relief by sitting on an ash heap where people burned all the unwanted things. He goes and sits on that and the warmth of those ashes and the smoothness of that powder. Maybe that, that was like talcum powder. You know, everything when it is burned, it becomes very smooth. He was finding some relief from it. And his misfortune is read by his wife. She is telling Job, why don't you just utter your last blessings to God and die? The word there is curse God and die. Actually, it means utter your blessings to God. That means do your final blessings to him and die. So basically, she might have been saying it in a mocking sense also, where she basically meaning you curse God and die. Because she herself cannot see the condition her husband is in. <clears throat> and Job's friends hear of this. Now, if you want to estimate the condition of Job, if you want to even estimate it, you know, I know these boys can be dramatic, but if you want to get an estimate, these three boys, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar, they come to visit him and seeing Job, they remained silent for seven days. That was the shock they were in. They didn't utter a word. They just did not talk about his condition. They, just, they were just shocked. This man was the most righteous of all we know. And look what has happened to him. So in these seven days of silence, they are estimating and trying to probe with their own scales of righteousness as to what might have gone wrong with Job. You know, because they have come to believe God as a God who protects if people are good. But this man was the best of the kind on earth. He was the one who was without sin almost, you know. He was such a good man. And this has happened to him. Then there must have been secret sins. And you know, all these kind of thoughts come to them. And after those seven days of silence, they break their silence and they come to Job one upon the other, discussing with him. Don't you know that this could have gone wrong in your life? Somewhere there is a secret sin, hidden sin. All of that is opened out against Job. And the poor man Job doesn't even know that a cosmic drama is unfolding against him, has been unleashed against him. He has no clue as to what is happening in heaven and what God has allowed in, Job, in, Job, in Job's life. He has absolutely no clue. And despite not having the answers, Job does not do Deva Dushanam. He does not blaspheme God. He does not curse God. 
Now, this is something that we all have to do sometime in our lives. We need to come to a point of decision saying, Lord, whatever goes wrong with me or whatever misfortune I may come to, let there never be a day when I will say anything negative or hurt you with my words. You know, let there never be a day like that. <clears throat> okay, that is something that we should all do. And somebody will ask me a question. Why should we even pray that prayer, brother? If we pray that prayer, then God may bring the misfortune upon us. You know, <laughs> No, that's part of your intimacy with God. Because you trust him to be your companion. You trust him to be your companion in everything. And yeah, Job... It will, it will yeah, go wrong, ahead. Job. It will be a wrong understanding for us to have that uh, yeah. you know, being with God does not mean that... Uh, or, uh, you know, uh, does not mean that you will not get any problems. I think yeah. that's a wrong understanding. Yeah, like, it's a wrong understanding. You're right. It's absolutely wrong understanding because a lot of people say, you know, I'm with God, I'm with God. Yes, that is with God. But then yeah. that is absolutely not a guarantee that you are free of all problems. Absolutely right. right. Yeah, mm. because, uh, you know, you know that there are some, some theology like that, you know, some mm. understanding like that. You... Yeah. Just, uh, you know, do this prayers, do that prayers, uh, you know, mm. think positive, yeah. speak positive, mm. uh, you know, everything goes, uh, you know, well for, uh, you know, so th those are, those are all wrong uh, in understanding because, yeah. uh, you know, nowhere in the Bible it says, yeah, uh, nowhere uh, in the history we see that. Yeah. So I, th I think this, uh, this is very important aspect uh, you know, yeah. of, uh, of our spiritual growth. Yeah. We tend to grow. Once, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you go through this uh, grind. <laughs> yeah. Right? Uh, yeah. See, this is the difference in religion. What yeah. is religion? Religion is playing it right according to God so mm. that no misfortune will befall us. Yeah. Okay? And all attempts of religion is to domesticate God into mm. giving what we need. Into God playing for us uh, everything that would be right with us. Yeah. But God, what we forget is the God of the Bible is God of history. Mm. He's working out his plan through history and he's looking for volunteers through whom he can make those mighty moves. Absolutely. Okay. Now there's this man Gideon who's afraid and who's threshing in a wine press and the angel comes to him and speaks to his potential. Oh, mighty man of war. Okay. This fellow is wondering, I don't even take a sickle to fight against anyone. You are calling mighty man of war. Yeah. So that is the way God is. And the God of the Bible is a God who is related, whose goodness is in relationship with us. His goodness cannot be experienced in the religion that we propose to him. His goodness is in the relationship that we enjoy with him. Now, there is a movie. Now, don't say I'm, I'm re re recommending people to watch a movie. There's a movie, very old movie called Over the Top. Now, over the top means you now all things rubbish that is dished out to us in our mobiles. But there was a movie by that name, Over the Top, by Sylvester Stallone. Now, he's a truck driver and his wife is a rich lady who dies of cancer. Now, what happens in this? He has a son who is, a, who is brought up in the rich home. And the wife, before dying, she says, I want you to spend time with your boy and take care of him. Because the wife is dying and she's dying in her father's house, which she's very rich. And this man, the, uh, through whom she has the son, is a truck driver. And she wants to entrust the boy who has been brought up in every affluence, richness, luxury, and comfort. She wants to entrust the boy to the father. So as she's entrusting this boy, he just hates his father, you know, because he's a truck driver. And he, he's belonging to the poorer sections of society. And over and above that, he has never responded to his, uh, he has never had contact with his father because his grandfather, that means his wife's uh, father, used to destroy all the letters written by the dad to the boy. So one day when the boy is taken on a ride, okay, the boy, uh, this man goes and picks up his son and he's driving with him in the truck. The boy asks him a question. What can you give me? You know, he asks an arrogant question. What can you give me? Can you give me the life that my grandfather gives me? Can you give me that life? Can you give me a good education that I've, you know, he's studying in an Ivy League school. Can you give me that kind of education? What can you give me? And this father, you know, he's almost in tears. As he's driving the truck, he shakes his head. And he, he says, I can guarantee you nothing except my companionship. I can guarantee you nothing except my companionship. That is gospel hidden. When you want to look at relationships, that is gospel hidden. Jesus says, foxes have holes 
and birds have nest, but the Son of Man has no place to lay down his head and rest. Are you willing to follow me? But I will be with you always. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what God is telling is, I can guarantee you no goodness, but what I can guarantee you is my companionship. That is the secret of relationship. All right. So as Job goes through this, there is a very important verse. You know, the, the, the friends, the three friends of Job come tearing at him from all directions with all kinds of justifications and, and arguments. And as Job is listening and he is replying back in the way he, he best can, you know, nowhere. He's angry with God. Please understand this. Job is angry with God. He is only going on to tell, I'm going to question God on this. I'm going to ask him, what did I do wrong? You know, that, that is his tone. Nowhere there is disrespect in his tone. All right. Whereas the people who are arguing with Job, the three friends, there's a lot of disrespect. They are proposing that Job has secret sins and he's, he's uh, lost it with God. And that's why God has allowed such a disaster to fall on him. Now, Job comes to a conclusion. Chapter 19, chapter 19, verse 23. Job says, eh? listen to this. This is the beauty of Job. Oh, that my words were recorded and they were written on a scroll that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead and engraved on a rock forever. Who's the rock? Try to find out what is that word rock saying there. Engraved on a rock forever. That is Christ. But he's, he's uttering prophecies that he himself doesn't know. Okay. I know. Okay. He says this. So what does he say? Oh, that my words were recorded and they were written on a scroll that they were inscribed with an iron tool on lead or engraved in rock forever. This request of Job has already been granted. We are reading Job because it has been recorded in a scroll. Okay. And uh, it has been recorded and etched upon the rock of Christ. Now the other, next, next verse, verse 25. I know that my Redeemer lives. The moment that word rock slips out from his mouth, there is further prophecy coming out from his mouth. That is why we need to stay close to scripture. There's further prophecy coming. He says, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end, he will stand on the earth. Even though my skin and flesh have been destroyed, yet in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I am not another. How my heart yearns within me. Job has given up the desire of living. He is yearning to see his Redeemer. But the point is he cannot die. Yeah. I don't know why. Because every thought of dying for Job is being eliminated. Because God has not allowed Satan to touch Job's uh, mind. Mm. Okay? He's touched Job's body. Now through the body, he has to manipulate the mind. That is the ploy of Satan. Now this is the same ploy he's using for us. Okay? When we walk down that street and see all the kebabs hang hanging there, he's using our eyes to, to manipulate our mind into wanting to eat and then we start then the only only starting is there no ending happens so like this very 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 uh, uh, many such occasions satan manipulates us through through our body okay now not that god did not allow satan to touch his mind the mind is connected to the body because the soul is connected to the body and it is connected to the spirit all right so this is what is happening and as they go on, then a, a new character appears. And his name is Elihu. A new character appears. He's a young person in, verse, in chapter 32. A young person who comes and joins the scene. What is the significance of this young person? He comes and speaks things to Job that are very, very condescending. When I say condescending, that means, Job, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. You know, that seems to be the echo of what he's saying. And later on in the book of Job, now this is where these are the clues that we have. Later on in the book of Job, in chapter 38, the Lord speaks. He comes and reprimands the three friends of Job. He reprimands all these three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And he tells now, I have stepped into Job's situation. Satan has failed. He can no longer say the whole world is under my sway. Because God has an exception in Job. Does God have an exception in you and me? And are we the exception who will crush the kingdom of Satan? Please think on that. And as God is speaking to Job, uh, he speaks to his three friends and says, go to my servant Job 
I have healed him. There it is an instantaneous healing for Job. And how does that come? In the New Testament, you will see Jesus healing leprosy, skin diseases instantaneously. Job's desire of seeing the Redeemer is granted. And as Job is healed, there are some beautiful things hidden there. As Job is healed, the three friends have been advised by God, go to Job and he'll have, offer a sacrifice for you. So the three friends have to go. But Elihu is nowhere mentioned by God. That means it's quite possible. Now, please don't get me wrong. I'm using the word carefully. It's quite possible. The lot of our arguments can be, con can be condescending and they can be nonsense. That means when we argue, discuss, debate with a person outside of a relationship, we can prove to be disrespectful and that God does not want. Even when we are sharing the faith and things like that. I have had times when I used to share the faith with the people of other faiths and I used to become disrespectful of them. And that is something that God does not even refer to uh, in setting something right. That means if something is wrong, he will set it right. If something is nonsense, you can just ignore it. Because that is what God has placed us into. He has placed us into relationships with people. And later on, the book of Job concludes with a beautiful message that Job received, not received, his cattle didn't resurrect. Okay? All his cattle were restored to him. That means he had another 10 children. Why didn't God resurrect his previous 10 children? He had another 10 children. And he was restored all his heads of cattle Twice the number. He had only one, but he kept the wife, same wife. Wife. So the people joke and say, God had to give him a second wife. He didn't, she didn't want to do. That is God's silent way of telling, one is good enough for you. <laughs> so that is, so that is, that is there. But what does this signify? That he had from 7,000 heads of cattle, he was given 14,000 heads of cattle. And from 10 children whom he lost, he was given another 10 because God is giving everything that he lost as twofold. Okay. Then I was thinking God should give him 20 children and not 10. Okay. That was my, one of my thoughts that came. And suddenly it struck me that God is a God of resurrection. He has his 12, he has his 10 children with him in heaven. And so see the motif of the resurrection, the motif of eternal life, motif, M-O-T-I-F-F. The, the sign of it is there in the book of Job. Yeah. That the cattle were given double to Job, but the children were not given double. Which signifies us, signifies that God is a God of resurrection and eternal life. And God has Job's 10 children for whom he used to sacrifice, pray for, and intercede every day. God has his 10 children with him in heaven. And he's giving him another 10. All right. So this is the message of Job. Who is the author of both the book of Job? Yeah. The, the book of Job, we do not know who the author is. All we know about the book of Job in its authorship is that the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It is predated even to the book of Genesis. Genesis that yeah. means it could be Moses, yeah. as some scholars say, but we don't know who the author is. Hmm. But in the land of, in a certain land of Uz, you said, there lived a man called Job, which, which clearly tells us he's referring to a certain land, certain means sure land, in which a surely living person Job was there. And this is what happened to him. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, George, uh, you wanted to ask a question? Oh, one second. One second. Let me just... You have to admit it. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yes, brother. Yeah. Uh, this one uh, regarding the Job. Yeah. In the Bible, mm. for Job, title is given a man with righteousness. Mm. And three words coming out of the mouth of God mm. with conversation with the devil. Yeah. The person who uh. is righteous, uh. shun to do evil, uh. fear the God. Uh. This righteousness. Uh. You know that this title is not even given anyone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The question is: uh, Is God punishing, uh, testing uh, to Job because of the dialogue between the Satan, mm. or as per the Job four fourteen, because of fear he allowed enter into the heart? Mm. 
Yeah. Okay. So what is happening here in chapter one? Is that God is calling Job righteous. If God has to call you and me righteous, what is the criteria? Our righteousness is in Christ. All right. That is yeah. our criteria. That means we immediately should shun our own righteousness and stand in Christ. We say, thank you, Lord, for calling me righteous. But for your son, I would have remained unrighteous. So thank you, Lord, for qualifying me in Christ. That would be our prayer and something to that extent we would say and thank God for giving us Jesus. What was Job's righteousness? Not that he was perfect without sin. His righteousness was like ours because he used to be righteous but never considered himself righteous. That was his attitude. And it is for God to say he is righteous. Why? Because Job does not consider himself righteous. When the three boys are attacking him, Eliphaz, Bildad and Zohar, when they're attacking, I don't say attacking, when they're arguing with him, Job starts talking about his righteousness. So what is he doing here? He's, he's confused in a certain, he says, I don't know why this is happening to me. I have done this, I have done this, I have done this. I don't know why this, this is happening. So he himself is coming to terms with what he's going through. And he's saying, I have not intended anything wrong for God, but I'm suffering. I don't know why. I would like to meet God and ask him this question. And if I'm not going to meet God, I want my tears, my story, my lamentations to be written. And that is the thing that he got. So what is righteousness for us? It is in Christ. Job also lived with that same righteousness. He did not claim himself to be righteous. All right? No, no. Brother, my question is... Mm. Is uh, Job is suffering mm. because of the not knowing the knowledge what God had deal with the Satan, yeah. or because of his own fear? Mm. Okay. If you read, if you read <coughs> Job does not uh, know what is happening ten. between Satan and God. Job does not know that. Yeah, correct. And nor does God reveal to Job that, you know, I'm sorry, Job, you know, I had to let this happen to you, boy. You know, the Satan fellow, he came and did all this to me and I had to prove that you are without reproach. And so God does not do have that conversation. And for yeah. your life and mine, God is not going to reveal what is the conversation between Satan and him. But we have, we have Jesus Christ as our, as our intercessor who defeats hmm. every accusation from the devil. Yeah. Okay. Now, Job, Job could not be accused even by the devil. That was his righteousness. But the attitude of Job was not that he claimed it righteousness. Okay. okay. So now this is, this is the attitude that uh, is there in Job because somewhere he's sensing that hmm. apart from me, there could be somebody else who's righteous. You know, I cannot think of myself as the more righteous. But what is it? It is right to have that feeling. You know why? One, it keeps us humility. But what Job was aspiring for, I cannot be the most righteous person. I may be doing things right, but God, somebody more righteous than me. And that is Christ. And that is Christ. So in his own attitude and exploration, he comes to the chances of Christ. I don't know if I answered your question. <laughs> okay, brother. Okay. What? Yeah. 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 So, uh, Josie, you're mute. Yeah, there's somebody. Uh, Percy. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Percy, you can ask the question. Yeah, uh, we uh, skipped Maccabees, is it? No, that is why, no, these, the Maccabees, one and two Maccabees will come to us after Malachi. We're doing that after Malachi. Okay. okay. We're sticking to a certain format given to us in the St. Paul's publication of the Bible, where they are giving us all the first 39 books of the Old Testament and the seven books, which are uh, canonical books for us Catholics, they give after Malachi. So Maccabees 1, Maccabees 2, Maccabees, all of that we will be doing uh, after we finish Malachi. So that we'll see the... Yes, which yes. Is the it's, uh, it jumps from uh, chapter... Oh, I mean, it's Which one, brother? 11. And in between, it keeps jumping. Mm. Is there any particular reason for that? Which one? You no, know, so, Percy, look, this is not a word by word Bible study. Okay, you understand that because that is yeah. what we discussed in no, the. Do it word by word. Yeah, not a word <laughs> by word. It is a, gives an overview of the book and the key messages. So, there is a 
format which we are following so we will skip a lot of uh, you know uh, verses uh, in the in the in the study and we are object our objective is to give an overview and we wanted to cover the entire bible in 24 hours time which is 1 hour per day so that is objective so you will find lot of uh, verses being skipped yeah yeah right. anybody else uh, would like to ask any other questions Jovan Nasaka, you want to ask? Uh, yes, I wanted to ask something. Um, but Brother Julius talks about uh, respecting other people and the way God doesn't like us to disrespect other people. Now, if you find yourself in a situation... You are not audible. You have to come yes. to the mic, closer to the mic and speak. Uh, yes, sir. You'll have to come closer and speak. Uh, I was saying that yeah. you talked about God doesn't want. God doesn't want. We lost you, sister. There. Eliaza in Job, in Job, the, the the younger gentleman in Job who was talking to Job. Yes, Elihu. Elihu, yes. Yeah. Um, God said, God doesn't want us to disrespect. But if you find yourself in a situation where mm -hmm. other people are trying to interpret. The Bible for you and pushing you mm. to accept, like the Pentecostals, pushing you to accept their beliefs. Mm. But don't, how do you get over that situation without not disrespecting them mm. and without, you know, because many times for me it's easier to just say, This mm. is what I mean and this is how <laughs> I accept my life. Yeah. But, you know, when they're trying to especially teach you about the, the prosperity gospel yeah and you find that they are they don't want you when you're suffering they don't accept that you know you should suffer mm -hmm. how do you not disrespect them or how do you handle that without disrespecting them okay see disrespect is is an instinct in us that comes out of us to anybody who would uh, who would uh, deal harshly with us in their words all right, in their words or their action, they do something harsh to us, it immediately, our response also becomes disrespect. So here is what uh, we can do. Sometimes for a lot of people out there who are more knowledgeable than us in the Bible, uh, there can be situations where we don't know enough about the Bible and they definitely know more. We can, we can understand that as we discuss with them. But instead of being disrespectful in our response, we have to only talk about the things that we are sure. That means, what are those things that we are sure? We'll have to respond in love saying, brother, sister, I really uh, uh, don't really understand what you are saying, or I'm not ready for that right now. But I'm sure of one thing, that I'm on my way to heaven. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. That is something that you are sure of, absolutely sure of. Just say that and withdraw from the conversation. Because as you kind of try to go into the conversation, there will be more areas because they, they people who intend to argue with you suddenly see that you are slipping out of the conversation by being loving. They will come after you now. So the best thing there is to always stay out of the conversation and say, listen, this is something that I'm not ready for right now. I don't understand it. But I'm sure of one thing, that I've been cleansed by the blood of the Lamb, and I'm on my way to heaven. I'm enjoying my journey, and whatever God wants me to learn, I'm sure he'll bring it to me in a better way. You know, something like that, you'll have to speak and come out. You'll have to work on your verbiage. You know, disrespect is something that snappingly comes to us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, you wanted to ask a question? I, I wanted to ask. Uh, it's uh, regarding Esther and it's a practical question. Uh, you know, we were talking about uh, power of fasting and praying. But uh, the seniors like us who are about 60, uh, do we, no, I mean, do we also, uh, you, do you recommend fasting for us also? See. If you go to the religious aspect of it, there'll be a heart, your heart which says, try and fast, try and fast. God will do something. God will give a breakthrough. You try and fast. Something like that will be coming into your conscience, coming into your mind. 
All right. What what I would say to anybody who is going through this kind of a situation, because we want answers to our lives and we want answers to the problems that we are in. For, to those of us who can fast and pray, let us fast and pray. To those of us who cannot fast and pray, especially the seniors who are above 60s, people who have um, uh, sicknesses. You know, I, 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 I heard of somebody who started to pray like this. Lord, heal me of my diabetes so I can fast for you. You know, I don't know how that, that, that means. What does it say? It says that there is a heart of fasting in the person. Okay. It is his diabetes that is preventing him from fasting. And he started to pray. He's, he's not putting a, pulling a small smart card before God. He's not doing that, but he's praying. Yes. So, I had a I had a similar experience. I was uh, daily going to church, and suddenly some pain in my legs. I find it difficult to walk. I yeah. I really told the Lord, I want to come every day walking to you. But see now this pain, please take away this. Mm. You won't believe it. Just like that, after a few weeks, uh, it went off. Yeah. No more to return. Yeah, Amen. Now you ask the Lord, Lord, you have given me this healing. Thank you, Lord, for it. Teach me how to keep my healing. How to keep my healing, you know? So that is an important. So that is an important aspect of the healing. All right. Yeah. I I have a I have a testimony where God did not answer my prayer. Ah. Yeah, which uh, I have been going for mass for the last one year. Mm -hmm. We are we are we were just about a week to complete one year. Okay. Yeah, just a week. In fact, ever since my son had received his holy communion, we mm. never missed. Mm. Yeah, and uh, we were looking forward to for that, mm. that completion of one year. Mm. And there were times when Lord opened up churches for us, exclusively for us. Mm. Amen. Uh, but in the last uh, one week, mm. we were all down with sickness. Okay. We, could, we could not go for ch go to church. So, so what I'm trying to say is that, you know, uh, so there are two parts. One is that, yes, I wanted to achieve something. Hmm. But the bigger part is that let it be done according to his will. Yeah. So there is a thin line between these two. There is a thin line between these two. Yeah. For me, it was very difficult for the to accept the fact that I missed my mass. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. And but I think uh, I have uh, you know it was not in my hands. <laughs> Being down with the COVID was not in my hands, right? Yeah. So uh, so so this are this is where uh, you know this is where actually you know the reality bites. Uh, yeah. It is not that you know you just uh, be always you know up and running, up and running. There yeah. are times. So so it is easy for me when I let. Yeah, God handle it because yeah. uh, the moment you handle it, yes. you become upset because you know you are failing to achieve something which you wanted to achieve. Yes, but that is not the what Lord wanted it. Let it be done because according to the will of God, yes. as Mary as Mary said, you know. Yeah. So for me, so this is a big learning in the last one week. You know, Amen. it would have been a different uh, you know experience altogether. I would have been so happy proclaiming it to the whole world. But God yeah. has a different plan. I do not know what, why, how, but let it be done according to me. So this is a journey which I think which everyone go through, especially this uh, book of Job is teaching uh, us that, like, you know, it is not, uh, it's not all about you, yourself. It's all about God. Even when your own eyes, you think it is good, but yeah. that uh, for God, in God's eyes, it could be a different uh, thing altogether. Yeah. See, even when Job's uh, story is written now in the scroll, it's part of the book, he got uh, the revelation of what happened in heaven. Now, that is intimately revealed to Job by God. Otherwise, how he could write that? Yeah. Wow, anybody could write it. Okay. So, there, that, that's why intimacy is important. And one of the important things is that in our relationship <laughs> with God, God achieves more through our relationship than through the religiosity we demonstrate to him. Okay, what do I mean by that? In the relationship, I'll say, Lord, I can't fast today. Mm. I'm not well. Yeah, yeah. Lord, can you uh, uh, tell me something else to do? And then the Lord says, do nothing. I want you to sleep and rest today. I say, Lord, I come for some paperwork. All this is not happening. Do something, Lord. God says, I want you to rest today. Okay, rest today. So that, that kind of hearing, if you want to have from the Lord, I would only suggest intimacy as 
we say abba father we are immediately brought into the presence of the father and then we start praising because of the presence we are in rather than praising to get into the presence yeah so these these are all parts of our growing up in christ which i'm sure the lord is leading us each one of us into so let us close it with a prayer uh, brother i will pray and after that joseph i want you to pray for my uh, health yeah. i've been having chills and body pain and fever yeah uh, and i don't have any uh, cough or sneezing mm-hmm. but i just want to get over with this keep yeah. smoking down all right let's pray in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit abba we thank you for all that you teach us we thank you lord that in your intimacy lord and in your relationship with us even as we have just said yes to you lord you do so much and reveal things that we would otherwise never know about how things are happening behind our backs we may not have answers for everything that we're going through lord but we know one thing that you are with us you have guaranteed your companionship with us and your intentions are always good and not to harm us even though we may be going through phases of pain and harm and phases phases of despair it may be a season of suffering but lord we know that you are always with us and you will never leave us nor forsake us lord we look forward to you 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 working in our lives like esther and we look forward to you making us stand out in our little testimonies like job that the devil would be crushed that he would be brought low in your presence and in our lives we thank you and praise you give us a good night's rest today even as we continue to meditate on your word we make this prayer through jesus christ our lord amen 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 yeah friends uh, i would encourage all of you to if you can all raise your right hand towards julius as uh, i lead the prayer may the lord uh, lord in his wisdom lord you know you know everything uh, what is <clears throat> running through uh, our mind you know lord we we lift up uh, we lift up uh, uh, julius uh, we will do it in silence uh, we you pray it in silence you pray it in silence i will make the i'll i'll lead the prayer father i thank you for uh, uh, healing uh, <clears throat> julius uh, as we all together in one heart agree and pray lord nothing is impossible for you lord this sickness what you have allowed in julius's life you have a purpose lord as your word says not even a single hair from our head falls without your permission and today lord we submit unto you into your hands the sickness that julius is going through lord we we also believe and we wanted to thank you for healing him as we pronounce healing in your mighty name we declare uh, that julius is completely healed lord jesus from the chills from the uh, fever that he is going through lord let this be uh, another way of revealing your love uh, for him through the sickness and through this healing that your love your uh, your mercy is been revealed and uh, is been experienced by julius more deeply than before lord through every moment of our lives you always hold us uh, in your palm and you will never let uh, us be- go down and be away from you and we thank you for holding him closer to you and we wanted to thank you very specially for using him as a powerful instrument in sharing your word and enlightening each one of us lord with your wisdom we make all this prayer through christ our lord amen Amen. 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 Yes. 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 My husband has already blessed you before you could tell. Yeah. You Thank are you. feeling. You are feeling. Thank you. So you Thank are you. in time to pray. Thank you. God bless you, Thank brother. You. Nothing will happen. Oh. Trust the Lord. Never do this. Get well soon. Thank you, sister. Thank you, brother. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.